What a great song and what great truths that it tells. Let's turn together this morning to the book of Acts and we're going to begin this morning in Acts chapter 13 and we're going to cover from verses 13 down through verse 43. So it's a bit of a lengthy passage and I want to read it to you in whole, so let me begin. Acts chapter 13, beginning in verse 13. Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos, and they came to Perga in Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But they went on to Perga and came to Antioch and Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with uplifted arm, he led them out of it. And for about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. All this took about 450 years. And after that, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king. And God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. Of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus, as he promised. Before his coming, John had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, What do you suppose that I am? I am not he. No, but behold, after me one is coming, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of this salvation. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize him, nor understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. When they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and for many days he appeared to those who had come with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news, that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus, as also it is written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy and sure blessing of David. Therefore, he says also in another psalm, you will not let your holy one see corruption. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God did raise up did not, uh, did not see corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish. For I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe even if one tells it to you. As they went out, the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. And after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. This is God's word. Let's pray together. Father, we ask this morning that by your grace we would see the remarkable truth of your faithfulness in Scripture. Help us to see this now as you illuminate this text by the power of your Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. All right, so I read through verse 43, and then what follows right after that kind of goes with this, but it's a lot to cover, as you can tell already. And so 
this and next week's sermon really go together as two parts. So you got to be here next week to kind of see the whole picture. Uh, what happens this week happens, as you saw, on a Sabbath day. And then next week's text happens the following Sabbath day. So it all happens kind of on two days just like this. And so you want to be here, right? Now, Acts 13 and 14, as I told you last week, recount what's commonly known as Paul's first missionary journey. It began in A.D. 46, and it's a journey that him and Barnabas go on together. They cover about 895 miles round trip on this journey, and so this is a lengthy journey. Their mission is to preach the gospel, and they do this because of the sovereign will of God. It's his will, it's his purpose, which is the reason they are left or they are sent out and they leave the church in Antioch. They don't do it because of their own initiative. They didn't think this up. This was God's doing. Remember we saw in Acts 13 too that God said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So in response to this, the church in verse 3 lays their hands on them and releases them by sending them out. And their journey, we saw last week, we begin, it all uh, starts on this island called Cyprus, which is a fascinating story in and of itself. They meet a, a Jewish magician who's a false prophet. He's full of deceit, Paul says. Paul's full of the Holy Spirit, so the magician is no match for Paul, and Paul preaches the gospel, and there's a great response as this uh, man who's the ruler of the island, Sergius Paulus, turns to faith in Christ. Now, after this happens, after they've preached the gospel to the whole island, they then set sail and they continue on their journey, which picks up now in verse 13. So let's look at this together. Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos, and they came to Perga in Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. Now Perga was north of Cyprus. It was about 180 miles north by ship. It was across the Mediterranean Sea. And it's in the region that's called Pamphylia. It's on the southern coast of modern Turkey, if you were looking at a map. Now, Luke doesn't tell us much at this point about why John, remember this is John Mark, who they picked up in Jerusalem and came back with him to Antioch and left with him on this journey. He doesn't tell us much here about why this guy leaves and returns to Jerusalem. Now, there's been a lot of speculation about why John leaves them and returns home. Some people look at it and say, well, I think John got homesick and he wanted to go back to his mom back in Jerusalem. Others say, no, I think that he got mad at Paul because Paul, remember now, has taken leadership of, of the group. And remember, it's his cousin Barnabas who was the leader. And so some people think that this kid, John, got upset because his cousin's no longer in charge. Paul is now in charge. Some people think that he's afraid. And he would rightfully be afraid of this difficult journey that's going to cause them suffering and persecution and sickness and all sorts of things. And then there are others that just think he just disagreed with Paul's decisions and the direction that he was taking the ministry, so to speak. And so he just got mad and just left. Well, whatever the case is, I don't know for sure, but I do know that in Acts, 15, Acts chapter 15, Luke is very clear that they look upon his leaving them as him having deserted them. In Luke chapter 15, verse 38, it says, he deserted them in Pamphylia. That's a strong word. He deserted them and had not continued with him in his work. Now his decision is ultimately later on down the road going to cause a rift between Paul and Barnabas that's going to cause them to split up and they're no longer going to continue to do ministry together on these missionary journeys. This is a pretty big deal. But for now, he leaves and Paul and Barnabas continue on without him. Verse 14 says, But they went on from Perga and they came to Antioch in Pisidia. Now Antioch, uh, also known as Pisidian Antioch, and I'll just refer to it as that, is not the same as the Antioch that they left from in Syria when they set out on this journey. In fact, believe it or not, in the ancient world, there were about 16 cities named Antioch. And so that was kind of as confusing as why there's so many roads around here named Adams Road or something like that. I, when I first moved here, I didn't know where I was. They said, get on Adams. I was like, which Adams? I have no idea. So he goes to this place, Pisidian Antioch, and it is uh, in Pisidia, and this is, uh, the, this is the region of Galatia, the same region that Paul is going to write the book of Galatians or the letter to the Galatians in. 
And this statement, that, let me just look at this thing. They went from Perga and they came to Antioch. Now, that seems pretty mundane to us. We look at this and say, ah, oh, it's just some travel details. Um, this is about a 100-mile journey to get to this place, but it's really anything but a mundane journey at all. In fact, this is a, a place that, that is about 3,600 feet in elevation from where they were once at down along the coast, and they had to travel across the Taurus Mountain region, which was a very dangerous mountain region both in terms of its geography, it's very dangerous, there are many uh, drop-off cliffs along the way, so they had to use some skill to traverse this area, but also that area is overrun with bandits and robbers who stole from people and mugged them along the way. So this is a dangerous journey for them to go on. And I think when you look at this journey, you realize that there was some commitment on their part to go to this place. Now some people say, well, why did they go to this place? Why didn't they stay in the area they were in? Now one of the theories is that Paul, we know, became very sick during this point in their journey. In fact, in Galatians 4.13, it says, As you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. This has led to a lot of people thinking that Paul might have had malaria around this point, which was common in that coastal area, and so they think maybe he got sick, he had malaria, and the temperatures were very hot and miserable there. His fever would have been very bad, and so the thought is, is that they, could, you know, they didn't have Tylenol and Advil to lower his fever, and so maybe they had to get to a higher, uh, cooler temperature, and so that's why they go to this area. Who knows, but travel in the ancient world is obviously hard. It's very dangerous. And because of that, it makes Paul's missionary journey, uh, on one hand, very impressive, but I think it also makes it very instructive to us. When we look at his journey, we see that there's some instruction here to us that says to us, listen, gospel missionary work isn't easy, and you can't expect for it to be easy. In fact, if you're going to undertake gospel work, you should intend in the process to suffer because you're going to suffer. It's going to be a requirement. And so I think that that may be one of the reasons that many people don't undertake full-time gospel ministry, because they look at it and they say, I don't want any part of that, because I know that what comes with that is suffering, and I don't want to suffer. And so out of a desire not to suffer, but leave, live a, a more easy life, they don't do it. Don't go into ministry if you're looking for an easy life. That's a lie. It's not true, all right? So here's uh, where we're at. He, he goes to Antioch and Pisidia. Verse 14 says, on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and they sat down. Now, this is the typical pattern in Paul's ministry. He reaches a new city, makes contact with the Jewish community, and on the first Sabbath he's in town, he typically goes there and he preaches the gospel. Verse 15 says, after the reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. Now, this is the standard pattern of worship that takes place in a first century Jewish synagogue. There's kind of a, an order of service. <coughs> Excuse me, we might call it a liturgy. And the way it works is, is that the service would begin with them reciting the Shema. You know, the Shema is found in Deuteronomy 6.4. The first word in Hebrew is the word Shema. In English, it's, it's here. And so it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. So that was the first thing that happened in their worship service. They recited that. This was followed then by a prayer and then by two readings. The first reading would come from the law, which would be the first five books of the Old Testament, the Torah, the, the books that Moses wrote, followed by a reading from the prophets. And so you see here in verse 15, there was a reading from the law and the prophets. After that, there would come the fourth element, which we see here is a word of encouragement or an exhortation, and that would usually come from one of the men in the service who might be a, a guest, it was maybe from one of the teachers in the synagogue, but if they had a traveling rabbi, he would be the one to do that, and then there would be followed up to that an exposition. So those were kind of the five things that took place in a service. So very uh, unusual compared to what we're used to today where we sing and do other things. Now, it's likely that Paul had established contact with the, the rulers of the synagogue. Actually, technically, they're called the presidents of the synagogue. 
And so he would have made contact with those people during the week. He would have said, hey, we're here. And knowing who he was, because he had a strong reputation, remember he was uh, trained at the feet of Gamaliel, they would have invited him, would you like to say something in our meeting this week? And so that's probably why he winds up speaking. So this is what happens in verse 15 when it says, after the reading from the law and the prophets, then the ruler sent a message and said, do you have any word of encouragement for the people? Say it. Verse 16, so Paul stood up and he motioned with his hand and said, men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. Now what follows is the first recorded sermon of the apostle Paul in scripture. Now this is not the first sermon of Paul. Paul has been preaching for years at this point, as we read earlier in Acts chapter 9, but this is the first recorded sermon. Not only is it the first recorded sermon, it is the only recorded sermon that we have of Paul in a Jewish synagogue preaching in that context. This is a very unique sermon. His sermon is very similar to Stephen's sermon that we read back in Acts chapter 7 because like Stephen, Paul is going to give a complete recap of Jewish salvation history. Now this leads me and others like me to believe that that probably means that Paul had listened very carefully to Stephen's sermon before overseeing his execution and that he had replayed that sermon in his mind for years and years and years and thought deeply about it. His sermon is also very similar to Peter's sermons that he preaches in Acts chapter 2 and 3 because he uses scripture to demonstrate that Jesus is the Messiah. So when you look at Peter's sermon alongside of Paul's sermon, you see that the emphasis, the focus of preaching to a Jewish audience was on what God had done through Jesus as the Messiah, which makes that sort of preaching very different from the average sermon that will be heard in pulpits across America today. Today, the preaching in most churches will be very man-centered and self-help oriented, whereas preaching in the New Testament was very God-centered and redemption oriented. It was all about God's redemption of his people through Jesus the Messiah. So Paul's sermon takes place in verses 16 to 41. Let me help you here, all right? I want to break this down to you for you so you, you can see the way it divides up into three sections, all right? Each of these sections begins with Paul readdressing his audience. So look at verse 16. Men of Israel and you who fear God. Those would be Gentile, God fears, who had converted. He tells them to listen. Look down at verse 26. Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham and those among you who fear God. He's readdressing them. That's section 2, begins verse 26. Look at verse 38. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that's the third section. So here's a basic outline of the sermon. Verses 16 through 25, that's section 1. They recount God's election of Israel and his faithfulness to his covenant promises. That's what he's going to do there. Then in verses 26 through 37, he's going to explain God's fulfillment of his covenant promises to Israel through Jesus. And then in verses 38 to 41, he's going to exhort his listeners to respond to God's message of salvation through faith in Jesus. So that's the breakdown of this sermon, and now I'm going to walk you through everything he says. So this is going to be a very uh, expositional uh, sort of, of look at, at Paul's exposition, if that makes sense. I don't know what that even means, all right? But look at verse 16. I know what I'm saying. You don't, okay? Uh, so Paul stood up, and motioning with his hand, he said, men of Israel, that's the Jewish audience, and you who fear God, that's the Gentile God fears, listen. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt, and with, with uplifted arm, he led them out. Now, all Jewish theology was built upon two key doctrines, all right? You should be writing this stuff down, two key doctrines, okay? Here's doctrine number one. Doctrine number one is monotheism. That's why they, they state the, the Shema at the beginning of the service. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So the, the fundamental doctrine of Jewish theology is that there is one God. He has revealed himself to his people by his covenant name, Yahweh. The second key doctrine in all Jewish theology was the doctrine of election. 
That meant that God had chosen Israel to be his covenant people. It was his choice to choose them. And so they referred to the one God as having elected Israel to be his covenant people through whom he would bring about his redemption in the world. So Paul didn't abandon this theology when he converted to Christianity on the road to Damascus. Instead, he came to understand that all of his theology was now to be fully understood in relation to Jesus the Messiah. So notice these two key doctrines that are foundational to Paul's sermon. Verse 17, he says, the God of this people Israel, that's monotheism, chose our fathers, that's election. And he made the people great during their stay in the land, in Egypt, and with an uplifted arm, he led them out. Now, because of those words that he opens with, it's led many scholars to believe that perhaps the text that was read from that day, from the law, would have been Deuteronomy chapter 4. Listen to what verses 37 through 39 say. And because God loved your fathers... And chose, there's that word, that language of election, their offspring after them. And he brought you out of Egypt with his presence by his great power, driving out before you nations greater and mightier than you. Remember all of these themes as we go through this today. Driving out of nations. He chose your fathers. He says he's going to bring you into this land for an inheritance as it is in this day. Verse 39, know therefore today and lay it to your heart that the Lord is God. This is monotheism in heaven above on earth beneath. There is no other. So notice this text in Deuteronomy teaches election. It teaches monotheism. And now in this sermon, Paul is going to emphasize God's grace in choosing Israel, sustaining Israel, delivering Israel from slavery in Egypt, and then ultimately because of his faithfulness and his covenant promises that he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, bringing them into the land. Look at verse 18. And about for 40, about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. All right, so after God delivers Israel, Israel in the wilderness is obstinate, they're rebellious, they disobey God, they don't want to go into the land, and it says he put up with them. He put up with them. Don't you love that? See, God is who? He's the father of Israel. So if if you're a father or a mother, you understand the language of putting up with. You put up with your kids, all right? But all this, despite Israel's unfaithfulness, God remains faithful. And why does he remain faithful? Well, in Israel's understanding of Jewish theology, they would say, well, God is faithful because he chose us to be his people. And so that, since that's what he's done, then we belong to him. So just like a parent who puts up with their kid doesn't at the end of a long day say, that's it, I'm getting rid of them, all right? You don't do it. Why? Because they're your children, and so you keep them, okay? So ultimately, your kids grow up, and they turn out, Lord willing, to be good people in the world, and the reason they do is because mom and dad were faithful to them despite the fact that they had to put up with them, all right? And if you don't understand that, just have some kids, okay? Verse 19, and after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, see, there's that theme we just saw in Deuteronomy, he gave them their land as an inheritance, God remained faithful to the covenant that he made with Abraham, so he fulfills his promise. He gives all this land to him. Verse 20 says, all this took about 450 years. So that includes all the time spent in Egypt, and then it includes the uh, the 40 years of wilderness wandering, and then the first 10 years of the conquest. This is about 450 years. And then after that, it says he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. So now look at this. This is pretty amazing. Verses 17 through 20 covered all of Genesis to Joshua. Now in verse 21, he's going to cover Judges through Ruth. So this is a summary then of the first eight books of the Bible in five verses, which for you and me, that means like five months of our Bible reading plan. Don't you just wish it was that easy? Some of you are like, well, you could have just told us that. Then we'd have to spend five months reading all of it, all right? But that's what that is, okay? So now look at verse 21. Then they asked for a king. Now, 
That's where we're kind of at this area of our Bible reading right now as a church, right? If you're new to our church, you don't know what I'm referring to, we read the Bible together as a church. And if you're not new and you don't know what I'm referring to, we read the Bible together as a church. We don't know what you're doing, but we'd like you to be part of what we're doing, okay? So it says that they asked for a king because they wanted him to, they, they wanted to be like other nations, so they just said, Go, give us a king. We want to be like these people. That's what they said in 1 Samuel 8, is that uh, in 1 Samuel 8, they asked for a king because they reject God. And so look at this. God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, and Saul was king for 40 years. Verse 22 says, when he had removed him, and now why did God remove him? Because Saul was like Israel. Israel, who was obstinate and disobedient and rebellious, said, we want a king, and God gave them a king who also turned out to be obstinate, disobedient, and rebellious. And so God removes him, and then it says, he then raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do all my will. So Paul's statement about the rejection of Saul and the raising up of David is a blending together of two verses in the Old Testament. In Psalm 89, verse 20, it says this, I have found David, there's that language of found, my servant with my holy oil I have anointed him. I've made him king. And then 1 Samuel 13, verse 14, also comes into uh, Paul's quote here. It says, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Now Paul says in verse 23, of this man's offspring, this man being David the king, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus, look at these words, as he promised. What Paul is referring to here is the covenant promise that God made to David. We call this the Davidic covenant. This is made in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Let me read it to you in verses 12 and 13. God says here, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, he's talking to David, I will raise up your offspring after you. What did Paul say in chapter 13 of Acts, verse 13? Of this man, David's offspring. Look at what he says here in 2 Samuel. He says, I will raise up your offspring after you. He shall come from your body. He will be one of your sons. And I will establish his kingdom. Who's going to give the throne to this person? God is. Verse 13. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom, and how long will he rule for? It says forever. Now this covenant promise that God makes to David is the very thing that gets emphasized when Gabriel the angel shows up and tells the Virgin Mary that she's going to have a little baby. What does Gabriel say? Well, in Luke chapter 1, verse 31, he says this, And behold, Mary... You will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, he will be called the Son of the Most High, and watch this language, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob, and how long will he reign for? Well, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Isn't that incredible news this morning? That Jesus' kingdom will come to no end. I know that many of you realize that we spend our life in this country hoping every four years for better changes in leadership. In the kingdom, you will never hope for a better change in leadership. It will last forever and it will be perfect. When Jesus is born, the angel then comes along, uh, angels, and they announce his birth to the shepherds out in the field, and listen to how they describe him in that moment. In Luke chapter 2, verse 11, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ, that means Messiah, the Lord. So all of this is what Paul is referring to in verse 23 when he says in his sermon of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus, as he promised. Now, it's this statement right here. Look at verse 23. Underline that verse. 
This is the entire point of Paul's sermon. The entire point of his sermon is this. God has fulfilled his covenant promises to Israel through Jesus, who is the promised Davidic king. He is the Messiah. He's Israel's promised Savior. So now, Paul jumps forward a thousand years from where he began with the first few verses of his sermon. So look at what he says in verse 24. Before his coming, that means before Jesus' public ministry, John had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. So when John the Baptist was in the wilderness preaching, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand, the people were being baptized. And then verse 25 says, and as John was finishing his course, that means as his ministry was coming to an end, and how does it come to an end? Because a man beheaded him. So ministry again, as I told you, is not an easy path. He said, who do you suppose or what do you suppose that I am? I am not he, meaning that some people were wondering, is John, are you the promised Messiah? But John rejects that. He says, no, I'm not him. No, but behold, after me one is coming, the sandals of whose feet I'm not worthy to untie. So as Paul's preaching the sermon in this synagogue, he's saying to these people, listen, don't you remember the way John described himself in relation to Jesus? John said of himself, he didn't even think himself worthy to do the lowest task of a slave in that day, which was to deal with the dirty feet of the people in their sandals. So this verse 25 now, now we come to the end of that first section of Paul's sermon. Verse 26 begins the second section, which remember I told you in the first section, he tells them, he reminds them of their history. And now in this section, he's going to explain to them how God has fulfilled all of his covenant promises that he made to Israel through Jesus. Look at verse 26. Brothers, see here's a readdress of them, his listeners, sons of the family of Abraham, those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of this salvation. The message of salvation is the message about Jesus. And what, is we, what have we been told about Jesus in this sermon? Verse 23, he is Israel's promised Savior. And now Paul says that this message about Israel's Savior has been sent. This is a divine passive in Greek grammar, which means that God is the one who has sent the message to them. So it doesn't originate with Paul. Paul's saying, I didn't show up here and make up this message. Rather, he says, we've been given this message. Our understanding of all of this Jewish theology being fulfilled in Jesus, that came from God. He's the one who said to us, let me explain to you your theology. So it's Revelation. Verse 27, he begins his explanation. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, now watch this word, because, because, you might want to circle that, because they did not recognize him, nor understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. So first Paul explains to them why the people that lived in Jerusalem and their rulers rejected Jesus and condemned him to death. Now you would imagine that would be a question that these people in the synagogue might be asking. They say, hold on, so you're telling us that Jesus is the promised Messiah, but Jesus was murdered by the Romans. They hung him on a cross and crucified him. So our question to you is, why did our leaders back in Jerusalem kill him? Why did they do that? If he was the Messiah, why did they kill him? And here's his answer. He gives two reasons. First, look, because they didn't recognize him. In other words, he's saying to them, they were blind. They couldn't see. They were blind to who he was. Look at his second reason. Because they did not understand the utterances of the prophets. So not only were they blind to see who he was, they were deaf. They didn't hear what the prophets were saying, even though, notice this, the prophets are read every Sabbath. How many times in my ministry, over 20 years of preaching, that somebody said, well, I just never do this. I said, but I preach this every week. And they said, well, I didn't know. And I'd go home and when I first was a pastor, and I'd just scratch my head and say, man, I need to do a better job. Then I realized they didn't listen to Isaiah either, and I just gave up. I just said, well, fine. They didn't listen to Isaiah, and they're not listening to me. But Paul says something about this rejection of Jesus. He says, this did not stop God from fulfilling his purposes. So even though these rulers were blind and they were deaf and they didn't do what God had, uh, had, had said 
of, of they, or they didn't recognize who God had said Jesus was, that didn't stop God from fulfilling his promise. In fact, verse 27 says that those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers actually fulfilled the words of these prophets when they condemned him. Paul now is making his move here, which is to show that the salvation of God's people comes through the death of Jesus. Their salvation doesn't come in spite of the death of Jesus. It comes through the death of Jesus. So verse 28 says, Though they found in him, in Jesus, no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they'd carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and they laid him in a tomb. So their rejection of Jesus, this unjust execution, it's not simply an act of injustice, it's actually an act of God. There's a divine purpose in what's happening here behind his death, and it's a purpose that was clearly stated in the prophets who they didn't understand. Listen to what happens in Isaiah 53. Chapter, three, or chapter 53, verse 3 says this, He, this is speaking of the suffering servant of Isaiah, the Messiah, He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised. And we held him in low esteem. Surely he took our pain and our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. So in other words, what they had not understood when they listened to Isaiah be read was that the very way that the Messiah would achieve victory for his people would be through suffering for the sins of his people. Notice it's a substitutionary sacrifice. Jesus, the Messiah, suffers and dies in the place of his people. And notice Paul says in Acts chapter 13, verse 29, that Jesus was hung on a tree. This is the third time now in the book of Acts that Jesus has been referred to as having been hung on a tree. Remember, it also said this back in Acts chapter 5, verse 30, and in Acts chapter 10, verse 39. And in each of those occurrences, when we studied those, I told you that to be hung on a tree was a reference back to Deuteronomy 21, 23 that says, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. So ultimately, Jesus is not simply cursed by God on the tree, but he is exalted by God in his resurrection. This is what Paul says in verse 30. But God, in spite of the fact that they had put him on a tree, condemning him as cursed by God, God then looked upon the empty tomb, or upon the the tomb of Jesus, and said, no, he's not cursed, he's the king. And so he raised him from the dead and left the tomb empty. God raised him from the dead, verse 31 says, and for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. So he says here the same thing Peter says in Acts 10. He's basically saying, look, even though in Jerusalem your leaders and your rulers condemned him, they executed him, they hung him on the tree, but God raised him from the dead. He vindicated his claim to be the Messiah. He exalted him. He gave him the throne of his father, David. That's the same thing that Peter said back in Acts chapter 10. And then furthermore, he also, like Peter in Acts 10, says, and it wasn't just some spiritual resurrection where we say, yeah, they killed Jesus, but, you know, his spirit lives on within us. No, he actually was bodily raised from the dead, which is why Paul says, for many days he appeared. He appeared to his apostles, they're now his witnesses to the people. In other words, they can testify to the truthfulness of his resurrection. Now look at verse 32. And we bring you good news, that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children. And how did he do it? Here's the answer. By. See that word by? By. By raising Jesus. Look. How does verse 32 says that what God promised to the fathers he fulfilled? He fulfilled all the promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by raising Jesus. And now Paul points to three of these promises in the Old Testament. Look at what he says. It's written in the second psalm. 
You are my son. Today I've begotten you. He's quoting Psalm 2-7, which was a messianic psalm that talked about the enthronement of the Davidic king. And he's implying here that the resurrection of Jesus is the moment in which God fulfills his promise to exalt the Messiah to rule over all the nations. Then verse 34 says, and as for the fact that he was raised from the dead and sure blessing of David, and now look, what Paul's doing here is he's loosely quoting from the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament in Isaiah 55, 3, what he's saying is this, because Jesus has been raised and because he's never going to die again, well, that means he can reign forever. And so for him to be on the throne is good because he won't have to leave the throne. He'll stay on the throne forever and ever. Then in verse 35, he says, therefore, he says in another psalm, you will not let your Holy One see corruption. Here he quotes Psalm 1610. That's a psalm that Peter also quoted back in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost. And Paul definitively explains it here by saying this. This is about Jesus. Verse 36, for David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, he fell asleep. That means David died. And he was laid with his fathers, that means they put him in a grave, and he saw corruption. Or as the NIV says, his body decayed. So that's where David is, which means he can't reign forever. But remember, God raised Jesus, and he raised him to live forever, which means he can reign forever, which is why he says in verse 37, when God raised Jesus up, he did not see corruption. There was no decaying of his body. It had no time to decay. He was raised. So Paul has explained here then in verses 26 to 37 how God has fulfilled his covenant promises to Israel through Jesus. He's the promised Davidic king. He's the Messiah. Or as he says in the moment that is the point of his sermon earlier, he's Israel's savior. So now finally in verses 38 to 41, he exhorts these listeners to respond to this message of salvation through faith in Jesus, and this is amazing when you see what he does here. Verse 38, let it be known to you, therefore, in light of all that he said, see that word, therefore? All right, so let it be known to you. In light of everything I've just told you, let it be known to you. And he readdresses them again. Brothers, that through this man, you got to underline that phrase, through this man, through Jesus, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Notice he makes two things very clear here. Number one, forgiveness of sins. You say, Mark, what is sin? Sin isn't some mistakes that you make. It's not a momentary moral lapse in judgment. Sin is a life lived in which if every second of your life is not lived in complete obedience to God, even for one millisecond, there's a moment in which in your thought life even, you rebel against God, then that means that you have sinned and therefore fit the category of sinner for your entire life's category. So you are a sinner. So notice, he says, forgiveness of sins is available. Well, that's great news because we all are therefore sinners. So we all need forgiveness. And he says that's available. Look at the second thing he says. It's only available through this man, Jesus. So there's no other path to forgiveness. So if you want forgiveness, there's only one place to go. You go to Jesus. You don't go anywhere else. You go to Jesus. You say, well, I've tried to live a good life. Uh Uh-oh, that's bad, because look what Paul's going to say about that in verse 39. And by him, Jesus, the only one who you can be forgiven by, Jesus, by him, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. So now I want you to circle that word freed. Both times it appears. Circle the word freed. Here's why I want you to circle this. This is more remarkable than you can possibly imagine. Remember, this is the first and only recorded sermon of the Apostle Paul in a Jewish synagogue. It's the first recorded sermon of Paul completely at any moment that we ever have on paper. And guess what the climax of his whole sermon is? It's justification by faith. You say, how do you know that? Here's how I know it, because I told you to circle the two words freed. Well, guess what those two words freed are in Greek? When you look at Greek, it's dikaio. And guess what that is? That is the word that we translate justified as a verb, to be justified. Justified. 
Dikaio is the word that means justified, so we can instead read it this way. He's saying, here, everything Paul has said in the sermon has led to this moment in which Paul says this. You cannot be justified by the law of Moses. You can write justified above the word free. You can only be justified by faith in Jesus. Paul's whole sermon about the history of Israel leads to one thing, and that's this. Jesus died, he was raised from the dead, and when God raised him from the dead, he fulfilled every promise he'd ever made. So you wonder if God's promises, yes, he fulfilled them all in Jesus. And because he's fulfilled all of those promises in Jesus, look at this, you can be justified from everything. Wow. Any of you in here ever wondered if there's like a few things that you might not be able to be justified from? You know what justified means? Justified is God's legal declaration that you are right in his sight. You say, how can God legally justify me as right in his sight when I've sinned greatly against him? Because Christ died and was judged for your sin so that when the Father raised Jesus from the dead, you now have all of your sin already judged in Christ. And Christ, having been raised from the dead, gives to you the gift of his righteous life so that you are now treated by the Father as if your life wasn't your life, but it was Jesus' life. And he says, you can be justified from everything, from everything. How many of you have gotten a lot of things in your life that you have struggled to believe? Could I be forgiven of everything? Here's Paul's definitive statement to you. It is inspired, holy words from God. You can be declared right before God for everything for everything. Do not make the mistake of listening to Satan who would say to you, you can't really be forgiven of everything because that one thing is so bad. If all those people in that church knew about that one thing, they wouldn't even let you in the building. Listen, I don't care what Satan says. He's a liar and a deceiver. I hate his guts and I'll tell you the truth of what God says. You can not only be let in the building, you can be let into the kingdom forever with Jesus because it's not about you. It's about Jesus. It's about what he's done. Paul says you can be justified by faith in Jesus. You know what's so remarkable? Paul is preaching his first recorded sermon. And where's this sermon being preached? In Galatia. What does Paul write to the Galatians? Oh, well, here's what he writes to them. Just a few months down the road, Paul has to write him and remind them. As if he's saying, like, I was there and I preached the sermon and you forgot? Listen to what he says in Galatians 3, verse 10. For all who rely on the works of the law. Oh, you were relying on the law. You thought you could do good and earn your salvation are under a curse. See, you're not free under the law. You're under a curse because it's written. Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law. That means if you didn't do all of it, you're like, well, I did the best I could. Well, no one cares about the best you could. That wasn't good enough. The requirement of the law is you got to do all of it. If you didn't abide by everything, because the law demands perfection, and that's why when we talk about sin, Scripture uses the language of missing the mark. You fell short. You shot an arrow at a target 100 times. You hit it 99 times out of 100. You thought you did good, but you weren't perfect, and you'll never be perfect, even if you hit it a million times in a row after that. That's sin. That's falling short. You fell short. But look at this, verse 11, it is now evident that no one is justified before God by the law. That's what Paul said right back here in his sermon in verse 39 in Acts. Here he says to them, because the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. The law, rather, is not anywhere near of faith. The law is based on works. The one who does them shall live by them. If you want to do works, then you better be ready to be judged by them. Verse 13, but Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Because it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. That's the reference that Paul made back in verse 29 in his sermon. He said they took him down off the tree. When he writes to the Galatians, he's telling the same thing. When I was there, I told you Jesus was on the tree. He was cursed. Why was he cursed? He was cursed for you. Your sin was laid on him. So you who deserve to be hung as a cursed person, 
You don't get hung as a cursed person because he was. And then they raised Jesus from the dead. And now it's by faith in him. Don't try to do good by trying to do good. You're going to wind up on a tree. No, that's not the way you do it. Verse 14, so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham, there's all those covenant promises of which Paul has spoken in Acts chapter 13. The blessings of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Not through works, but through faith. The climax of Paul's sermon here in Acts 13 is basically simple. If you want to be justified from everything from which you could never be justified by the law of Moses, in other words, if you want to be forgiven for all your sins and you want to be declared right before God, then you don't do so by trying to keep the law because you can't keep the law. So don't make the mistake of saying, I'm trying to do better. No, better is not, we don't care. Better is not going to work. Better is no good. Better is never going to make a dent in our sin in our need to be right before God. Only God's declaration of righteousness through, as Paul says in Galatians, Christ who redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Paul closes this sermon with a warning to everybody who rejects what he's called the message of salvation back in verse 26. He says in verse 40, beware, that's, that's language of, of warning, beware, therefore, so in other words, in light of what I've just told you about justification by faith, you need to beware, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. And then he quotes from Habakkuk 1.5, look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe even if one tells it to you. God is in, in Habakkuk referring to the judgment of his people because they failed to repent at the preaching of the prophets. And now then, Paul says, look, let me just tell you, if, you didn't just, if you're not going to repent in everything I just told you, then you're in the same boat. And this is his warning to them. You're going to be judged as well. So now then, here's their response, verse 42. As they went out, the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. So they said, come back next week. Tell us all about this again. And after the meeting in the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. Now, in verse 44, I want you to just notice what the first words of verse 44 are. The next Sabbath, see that? So guess what we're going to look at next week? The next Sabbath, and we'll see what happens. What an amazing text. What a great first sermon ever recorded by Paul. Shake your hand if you're tired of writing notes. I know there's a lot of information, but... This is an amazing text, and to the extent that we understand God's word, it's, it's to the extent that our lives will be shaped and formed by it. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you this morning for your faithfulness to all of your covenant promises. Thank you for fulfilling all of those promises that you made through the death and the resurrection and the ascension and exaltation of Jesus. Thank you for his present reign, that he is the ruling king and that his kingdom will never end. Thank you for the gift of salvation that is given to us through Christ alone, by faith alone. It's nothing that we can do. In fact, if we're left to ourselves, we would certainly perish. It's obvious none of us are keep, capable of, of keeping your law. We're never going to keep your law perfect, uh, in perfection and do everything we should, and so we're in a bad place. But Lord, in your love and your mercy, you chose to save us, and you did so by grace alone. So, Lord, we praise you this morning. We turn our eyes to Jesus, who alone is worthy of all blessing and honor and glory. And we pray in his name. Amen.